Well, the good news is I just found a cookie in my back seat. So that's oh. good. Uh, <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of cookie? A chocolate chip cookie. I think oh, that's pretty solid. That. That's a good that's um, <laughs> What's up, Movie Trivia Schmodown fans? Welcome to the Schmodown Rundown, the official after show for the Movie Trivia Schmodown. I am your host, Brad Gilmore, and I am joined by my man from Chicago, Illinois, which is the city where Home Alone was, of course, filmed, which was a question this week. My man, Frank Janish. That's right. I'm from Chicago, home of Star Wars Celebration 2019. Cannot wait. A lot of people hit me up for... Uh, bed space, which is great, but I only I don't have that much room. But uh, hey, Schmodown Star Wars match happened, team match happened, some other stuff happened, um, and uh, it was one hell of a week. And if you were at the live show and you're listening to this, uh, um, you're gonna hear you're gonna hear someone special to the Schmodown, probably the most important person in the Schmodown. And no, it is not Rachel Cushing, although she is. It- so Ben Bateman's back on the show? Oh no 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 no! Someone even better. Robert Meyer Roca. Burnett. Oh, Robert Meyer <laughs> Burnett. William Bibiani. Whitney. No 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 no. Oh. Guys, Henry Rowan Gardner. Guys, you see the show notes coming? Come on. Oh, that's right. Christian Harloff that's is going to be right. on the show. That's right. We're going to talk to him about the live event. We're going to talk to him about a couple other controversies that are going on in the movie trivia Schmodown. The Schmodown is never without controversy, and the man who seems to always be there for it is Christian Harloff. That's the gift and the curse of being the creator. But also, shout out to my man in Pennsylvania, Mr. Christopher Clark. Chris, how are you doing? I'm rocking this, uh, Brad and Frank. I'm. I, I, we were discussing how I, I, I'm Italian and I'm happy. So let's rock this circle. This is a great. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This, is, hey, you know this what? is a great show so far. Stop right there. <laughs> we were talking about how you're Italian. Tell the people your name. Oh, my full name is Cristoforo Paolo Pescetta Clark in Italian. I was given that name from my grandma Maria Margarita Pescetta Clark, but it was Americanized to Christopher Paul Clark. So that's Ooh, a mouthful. For all you. I heard was Margarita and Biscetti, but I love it. I love it, man. That's my <laughs> Italian biscotti? guy. Who's that Something biscotti? like that. I like it. I like it. We yeah. we I don't know what that is. We don't have a lot of Italians. That's how they say it down here in Texas. They say Italian. You know, my grandmother yeah. says, "You want some Italian sausage?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll take some Italian <laughs> sausage." She's like, "Italian sausage." I'm like, "Yeah, Italian sausage." Yeah, we have some Italian. Italian. Yeah. yeah, Italian. Frank, we know we have a lot to get to off the Italian names, off Christopher Clark. Off everything. Why don't we just not waste any time? Because you were in L.A., you were in Los Angeles, California. You saw the movie trivia Schmodown go down live and in living color. Uh, I know you have a lot of a lot of opinions on these uh, matches that we saw in the event as a whole. But why don't we get to the man who gave us this great gift of the movie trivia Schmodown first? I know there's some commenter on Twitter right now calling me a shill, and you know what? I got two words for you. Suck it. But let's get to our man right now, the creator, Christian Harlow. Well, we said we had a special guest on the show today, and I don't think that it gets any more special than this. Uh, It is the man who, the creator, the sometimes commissioner. He joins us by phone on his commute to his hacienda. Senor Christian Harloff joins us right now. Christian, how you doing? I'm doing good, guys. Thanks for having me. Sorry for the fact that it sounds like I'm uh, broadcasting in a wind tunnel. I just, uh, mama... (laughs) I'm on my way home, just taped some matches, and uh, yeah, I wanted to, I'm sure you guys had a lot of questions about the match, so I wanted to be able to answer as many as I could. Yeah, I think right now, the um, Schmodown universe has been set ablaze. I think it's similar to that of, you know, when Avengers came out this year, everyone's like, what the hell did I just see with this live event? I know you teased Frank and I before the live event saying that you were going to blow the roof off the place, and I think mission accomplished uh, is probably the most apropos term for that, and not in the George W. Bush sense of the term. I mean, actual mission accomplished. Uh, How do you feel, though, about how the live event turned out, Christian? I mean, for the most part, pretty great. Uh, I know that 
even though you know, and I'm sure we'll get into it too. It's like it's like I just can't I can't fucking get away from a controversy no matter what. It's like no, <laughs> any every single match. It's like no matter what. It's like whether the sounds off a little bit and I can't hear somebody to the one thing or the next. Something always happens, but um, that's just part of the game. But um, other than that and a couple of technical things, I thought it went it went off pretty well. And Frank, you were there live. Talk about what what you saw when you were up there. Yeah, I was there live for uh, the whole thing, and I was sitting in the crowd, and uh, I tell you, I mean, the reveal, being in that crowd, just looking over to the left of me, seeing the crowd go crazy, waving, you know, uh, those light-up um, swords or whatever they were, lightsabers-ish, um, just people just losing their minds, screaming their, screaming their lungs off. Uh, it was it was something to see, man, and uh, it was, you know, I just, I just couldn't believe that uh, finally pulled it off. You know, the reveal of the four horsemen, five horsemen. Um, Dan Merle comes out. I mean, it, it's it's executed really well. And um, the lead up to it, too, with Ben and Andrew, I thought was great. I loved uh, just watching the crowd, the whole the whole live event, really. Just I think a lot of them was their first live event. Um, I know I'll, I think maybe half or a quarter of them had been to the first one. So um, it was really cool to see those two dynamics, and uh, for everyone who went to their first live event there, um, I think you're going to have repeat customers for sure, especially after this one. Now, Christian, did you like notice a big, was there a big difference in your mind between the first live event and this one? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's the reason why I moved it to Saturday in the first place, is that um, you know, the first one was on a Thursday, it's a work week, people are tired, you can't really... You know, for people who were coming out of town, weren't able to plan around it and make their way there. And you're also at, you're also about there's about 115 more people than there were last time in the audience. And plus the, I mean, Frank was there in the green room, um, and there was like 40 competitors down there. It was there were so many people there. It was just the energy was incredible. And I knew that the ending was going to do what it did because of it. Just you know, it was it was it was theater. It it definitely it was WWE all the way there and and you know I I definitely appreciated watching it. Well, let's talk about the first match. And this is a question I wanted to ask you because a long long time ago we discussed this. You were like, you know, it's one part WWE writing this show, planning out storylines, where you want things to go. But the big curveball that you get is you can't always or you never get to pick the actual winner. You have to have kind of these choose your own adventure stories set up. And my question for you is this. Uh, I know you remain impartial, obviously, but do you ever, like, in your head, like with the Star Wars match, I mean, it would have been great if Knapsack pulled it off, right? Isn't that kind of where... Like, do you ever have, like, a certain person that you want to win just for the storyline's sake? I mean, all the time. It's just a matter of, you know, that's that's why... And we'll talk about it in the second match. People... I read some of the comments. People were like, oh, he clearly wanted Shire Wolves to win. You don't think that if in a perfect world... A Patriots getting the belts back, playing team action in their next title defense is like one of the most marketable matches of all yeah. time. Yeah, like it's it's like it's so stupid. It was like the thing is, if I if if I was able to maneuver people into winning the way I wanted to, Clark Wolf would be on her sixth title defense. You know, it's like there's of course there's people that I want to I, I I root for and I hope to because there's people that I think deserve it and put in the hard work. And there's an is a knapsack versus Sam Whitwer rematch an absolute barn burner and could it almost headline the collision all on its own yeah of course it would but that's not the game that was played on at the live event the, the game that was played was alex damon showing how much he knows about star wars maybe even more so than dave filoni and, <laughs> and and he and he earned the victory and he got it so now the new story is the underdog shy quiet kid going up against the guy who's actually in star wars yeah, yeah, he's in Star Wars. He's in uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Frank, now I know you're the Star Wars aficionado on the show. Uh, take it away with the Star Wars Triple Threat. Yeah, so first off, in that, that first round uh, is very, very close. Uh, Scrimshaw talked about it in his, in his pre-match uh, speech. Whoever, farts, whoever has a brain fart first is probably going to lose, and uh, that was very true in his case. He was the first to miss. Um, only four questions in. Uh, Demon and Amsock, they go perfect, including the bonus. So they get 11 points to Scrimshaw's nine. Um, I'm not surprised that Alex Damon performed as well as 
he did. I've been following his channel for a while, and even when he was in his first uh, five-way uh, way back when, um, I thought that he could win it. I really thought he could win it, and uh, he was off to a great start. So was Ken, and I know Ken really wants that belt back, and he, he has said things in the past about the way the end of that Iron Man match went down with Sam, so I thought he was going to be out for blood in this one, and I was really hoping that... Uh, a two-point deficit for Scrimshaw wasn't a death sentence here because when you're talking Star Wars, I mean, even a one-point lead can almost seem insurmountable when you're facing people like Alex Damon and Ken Knapsack. So um, I was I was, I was was pleased to see that the level of play was at the level it was in the first round, and I think it set up really for the rest of this match just how competitive it was going to be. And it's like that for every Star Wars match, it seems like. Um, the first round is always very tight, and it really sets the pace for the rest of the match. Christian, when you saw Scrimshaw get to that uh, early deficit, did you kind of think that in your mind, okay, he's not going to be able to pull this one out? Well, I thought he'd be able to. He'd have to dig himself out of a hole. I mean, Scrimshaw knows as, as much about Star Wars as anybody else. So, I mean, I, I, it was all about round number two, which ultimately turned out to be the case. I mean, it's you got to, yeah, you can't count Scrimshaw out. He, he knows a lot. It just that's. That is a hole to be in, especially when you are going up against Alex and Ken. But you know, lo and behold, we uh, he did come back, and he, he was he almost won the match. So yeah, he you know had he missed had he hit a couple up, up in that first round. It's we're we're not talking about Alex Damon. I'm talking about Scrimshaw. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And he you know second round was a little favorable for him. I believe he got the Force Awakens. Uh, for his category, did very well in it. You know, Sands maybe the uh, Conja Club, I believe, was a question that he got wrong, uh, which I don't know how you do when Mark Ellis is sitting right there. But um, with uh, Ken Knapsack, he spins heroes and villains. He's the only one out of the three that didn't land on a movie, uh, you know, a particular film from the franchise, more of an uh, more in- all-encompassing category. Do you think that played to his detriment and uh, ultimately being the first one eliminated from the triple threat? I think Ken's biggest problem I've sh- that, he, that he's shown in these last two Star Wars matches is he, his weakness is quotes. That's, I mean, if he if he knew a lot out of the quotes, he's still the champion um, because that's where Sam Whitworth got him with the quotes, and that's ultimately what sunk him in the uh, in this match. He he he's, he couldn't remember a lot of those about quotes in general, and um, I think that it's not necessarily heroes and villains who. Ken's pretty knowledgeable about all that stuff, but he just there's certain things that he would he had he had really bad luck this time around, and that's as much a part of the Schmodown game as anything else is, you know, luck of the wheel, luck of the questions, and and Ken uh, the luck just didn't go his way. Now, Frank, were you shocked though when Ken was the first one out in the in the three way dance there? I guess kind of. I mean, you never you you think that it's going to go down to the wire with all three of them. I will say. By Ken spinning spinning heroes first and then villains was very uh, poetic, uh, you know, basically outlining his run in the showdown going as a hero. <laughs> now he's a villain. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, you know, Alex Damon getting a new hope. I thought for sure he was going to get um, all ten points. Uh, he got nine, and then he ended up getting a steal uh, later on. But um, and then script. I mean, getting any kind of just movie category, I think, is probably an easier way to go. And yeah, I was going to say, it's probably the way to go. Yeah, because, I mean, you're... like, you know, you, weapons you can be locked and technology. In, yeah, because you can be yeah. locked into one movie, whereas Heroes and Villains, it's, it's going to span the entire franchise. So um, I thought it was a bit iffy for Knapsack, but I know he knows, like, all this minute uh, detail in Star Wars that uh, that he would do pretty well. And he did do well. I mean, he got seven points in that round, or six points during his turn, so... It's a little bit on the low end, relatively speaking, because he finished with seven points in the round, scrim show with eight, and then Alex Damon had ten. So uh, Alex Damon, I mean, and plus he had not missed a question besides the steal up until that, you know, uh, at that point. So I, wa- I want to say about Ken's Skywalker question that that quote that's a brutal that's a brutal question because you don't really think of oh the uniform it's I'm um, looks like we're coming here to rescue you. Um, I thought that was an absolute brutal brutal question to go out on. That's it's kind of I just I couldn't believe that 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 quote and it's you hear it and you're like oh yeah duh but I mean at, at the forefront of your mind it's I'm Luke Skywalker and all that so I thought it was a pretty and he had another brutal question uh, in terms of uh, his his three point was pretty brutal what oh, I forget which one it was 
I don't, I don't remember which one the, the three was, but I remember he had, um, yeah, he had some tough ones. But I also think one of the things I, I've asked Chris Galisky after that match to get rid of is the filming locations. I think it's, I think it's silly to ask, uh, yeah, you know, the fans to know where the locations are. It's not, yeah. that's we wouldn't get that from the movies as much too. So we're we're gonna we're gonna eliminate that from uh, from future Star Wars competitions. Oh, you know what? That is actually interesting. That did kind of pop in my head. You know. I wonder how much of the, you know, behind the scenes, if you will, like the post-production, the pre-production, the you know, director, writer, how far do you really want to go back with that in just general, in general schmodown competition? I mean, filming location seems to be like a little too far. It, do you want to stop it at like writer, director, and then kind of end it there? Or is it, you know, because I, I, my question is like, it's, it's mainly just about the movie itself, not so much the periphery of it. You know, release dates, of course, director, writer, but really not much further than that. No, I don't want to get into stuff like, you know, what city was this filmed in and stuff like that. That's not on That's not on film fans to really be on. I mean, if you're like a film student and your favorite, you know, like I'm sure, Brad, you know every location of where Back to the Future was shot, you know, but that's not, yeah. that's not on whoever you're playing to know that stuff. It's... It doesn't matter how much of a Star Wars fan you are, and you should, you know, Tunisia and all that kind of stuff. You shouldn't have to know that through the movies. Now, different do-backs and stuff of that nature, yeah, that's part of the their overall inside of the Star Wars galaxy. So that that stuff, I think, is fair game. But the locations, I just, I thought that was an unfair question. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I kind of like leaving it, like I said, and um, we'll see. You know, if that's eliminated, maybe it evens the playing field a little more. Maybe it doesn't. We'll see what happens. I I really love the Star Wars League right now because you know when you have the general Schmodown Singles League, then you kind of focus it even more in the inner geekdom, and then Star Wars is just you know even more. It's like a hundred time magnification, and I think that's why those matches are always so close and so fun because these guys are very high caliber. This is their expertise and uh i always love watching star wars matches even though i'm i don't really know any of the answers <laughs> i love watching those matches um let's talk about though the second match shire wolf's team action because this is the match that uh i think most people that came out today uh yesterday the friday match that most people are talking about right now for a multitude of reasons uh first off why put Team action versus the Shire Wolves. You're the matchmaker. You're Joe Silva. You're Pat Patterson. You're Vince McMahon. You're you're Bruce Pritchard. Why make that uh, matchup? Well, I mean, you're looking at the, some of the two, maybe like one of the top face teams, good guy teams out there against arguably the 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 best heels in the league. Um, and the DC match really added the clout to action because up until I think that they, they got themselves a little bit more oomph, pep in their step. I know it gave Andrew Guy more confidence going into it and it was a it was a good match to kind of build up their, their heel stature just a little bit more. The the idea was to get the Shire Wolves a match before that. They were going to play a match before that and then it was going to be a number one contender match in general but we uh, schedule didn't permit that. So um the Shire Wolves were always supposed to be on the card first. It was just a matter of who they were going to play. And then it did a perfect fit. Just, it, it, you know, the action in front of a live crowd, it just made too much sense and it proved to be true. Did you think they had the advantage going into that match just because they're coming off that win from D.C.? And it's a live crowd. These guys seem like they feed off that energy. Did you think that in the given the environment, they had the advantage? In a certain aspect, yes. Um, I think when it comes to, and I think that they tried to they tried to do that in their pre-interview. They knew that Rachel was um, Rachel was pretty anxious about the match. It's not it's no secret that that's that's not her forte. She's not, she's never pretended to be a performer. She's just a a movie lover slash um, idiot savant when it comes to <laughs> these movies, you know, and like. Um, that's not anything she ever wanted to do. So she was, she was, she didn't want to do the theatrics. She just wanted to play. Now, the same can't be said for Clark Wolf. Clark Wolf is a natural performer. When you when you watch that match back and you watch that entrance, Clark Wolf looks like she's sucked right out of a different world. I mean, she's she's there with a cigarette in her mouth, throwing things around. She's she's ready to mess stuff up. Like this, that's 
uh, Clark Wolf was born for that stuff. So I, I don't think that they had the advantage over Clark Wolf. I think that the, when it came to uh, um, a certain aspect, they had the. I think that it got to Rachel a little bit. I think when I think when Rachel started missing questions in that first round, I think that she let that get to her. Um, but Clark Wolf, and I'm sure I can attest to this as well. Clark Wolf was on fire in that match. Ooh. Yeah, Clark was um, very, very focused in that match, um, and that was one of the things I was uh, was wondering how much Rachel might lean on Clark if things got shaky for her. I, don't, I think that James Conn question, the elf question, really bothered Rachel because that's a pretty gettable question. I think um, that one probably hurt more than um, the Ghostbusters question. Um, and, you know, Rachel, yeah, you're right, is not a performer entertainer in that sense. Uh, that's not what Did she, she does. look shaken, Frank? Did she look shaken? On you know, st- I'm not was... shaken, but did, could 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 you tell that she was a little not crushed? It, it, it seemed <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, but luckily that was towards the end of the round as that round's wrapping up. So um, it didn't affect her because she went on a good run, her and, um, and Clark. You know, I think they answered like the first four or uh, what was it, the first four uh, questions correct and then she gets and then Rachel misses two in a row and then she hits that um, then she goes one for two of the last two So, but you know Clark Wolf though she hit seven and I said this in a stat segment she's hit seven points in the first round in her last five matches in a row um, and only Drew McWeeny is the only other player to do that so Clark Wolf is an absolute beast I, I brought I brought that up today at, at the office when I, when I I saw your stat and I was like, anybody who doesn't put Clark in the elite player list is yeah. crazy. They're crazy because, like, she, I, you know, and I think she got a lot more respect after her match with Sam, even though she didn't come away with the victory. But it's like, you, anyone who ever calls her uh, overrated is silly. They've got to look at those stats and realize that she is one of the best players that this game has seen. And it's really interesting to look at Rachel's stats because in singles she's does very well in the first round, but. In the first in the first round for teams, even going back to uh, Nerds Watch, she's averaging five points, five to six. So uh, it was interesting. To, it's interesting to see how that goes back and forth. It's it's really weird um, because we all know Rachel is has she has the top accuracy in the singles division. Uh, it just hasn't quite worked out in the team True, division for whatever you know, reason. It's a- but. It, it's yeah. kind of like, though, think about, you know, Steph Curry has all these points. He's averaging 30 a night, and then KD joins. You know, KD was averaging 35 with the Thunder, but then when they're on the same team together, obviously one's point average is going to go down. You know what I mean? It's just they're getting used to being in the team, I think, together, and, you know, your stats are going to kind of drop a little bit just being in that team, different handles on the ball, different format, all that stuff. Um, when you saw Christian, though, in that round number one with team action, when they were down, I think, at one point, eight to four, were you kind of like just from the promoter aspect and in the live crowd the last thing you want is just team uh or, or the last thing you want is the shire wolves just running away from it and team action just you know crap in the bed were you a little bit worried when it was eight four no i've seen team action come back too many times in round two to uh to count them out they're just uh the, yeah it would be a mistake for anybody especially myself to not think that i mean ben bateman is a an absolute beast in this game he, he, he studies so much and then drew i think drew gets shit on too much he, he's he didn't have the best first round but the guy um is a fighter and he really really studies hard there's a lot of stuff that he does know and and we'll talk about the third round in a second here but like he knows a lot of these he has a lot of these deep cut answers and when that round two and especially the funny thing is that the crowd didn't know but i knew when when they hit movie release dates i knew that they were going to be um they were going to be neck and neck going to the third it's, round. It's funny that you say that too, because when they were on here a couple weeks ago, they talked about why Kalinowski didn't give them movie release dates because Mike knows them and that Ben will decimate in the movie release dates. And I turned to my friend Andrew, I said, the only way they're going to get back into this, because this is after Shy Wolves had a great uh, second round. I said, the only way they're going to get into this, I think the only category they can run the table on is movie release dates. They hit it. And they go five of six for ten points, and I think really stunned a lot of people in the audience. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's because that's like the taboo. Um, yeah, your uh, category, and it's like the people you know that are good at it. Obviously, Mance, he's just got his picture on the damn thing. But it's like you look at, you look. I, mean, people, I think that people realize now that Sam Levine is pretty good at it, and after this, people are going to realize that Bateman is pretty good at it. And it's like it's one of those things that, like, I think it was a mistake for them to, to talk about it on your show. 
Yeah, <laughs> Andrew said as much as well. I mean, he's like, we don't give away our strengths or weaknesses, and yeah. at, at that point, they couldn't help themselves, I guess. And uh, I know Ben, after after the match, he told me like that uh, it was great to ace when we released dates, especially in front of all that that huge crowd. So um, that was a big boost for them. It was good. No, he, he, ben, ben knows that stuff inside and out. And, and when, when they hit that, I said, yeah, this is going to be pretty close going in around number three. Yep. Yeah, I think, didn't Andrew Guy say he asked Ben Bateman like 100 movie release date questions and Ben got like 88 out of 100 or something? Like like nine. I mean, almost went perfect on it. So I also knew, but I was was worried for a moment when the Shire Wolves got that horror category. uh, I was like, oh. The way that that happened. Oh, my gosh. It looked like it was going to hit opponent's choice and then just kind of jumped over to horror. (laughs) You just live for that kind of moment in a live setting where you get that kind of drama on the wheel. Um, it's, It's great. That crowd, yeah, went but nuts I, I definitely too. thought though. I definitely thought though, Frank and Christian. I'm sure you thought as well. When when that horror hits, I'm like, oh damn! It's a wrap. Like it's a wrap. they're it's yeah, yeah, they're already fighting from behind. Then they get their the Shire will get their strong suit. There's no way. But I was the same thing like you, Christian. When I saw movie release dates, I was like, Ben Bateman's got this. And what was the one they missed? Clueless was that the one they missed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Clueless that was a huge. That's a huge two point steal from the Shire Wolves, and that's when I really thought. They could be in some big trouble here, but they get the last three for six points, and uh, they're do- still down by two. There's a rhythm when you watch players play, though, and like when they play when above, when Team Action lost to Above the Line in the finals, like they fought back. People don't ever talk they about did. that match, yeah. but they fought back. They were getting their heads handed to them, and they fought back. And this wasn't that kind of match. They were always like you know pretty solid. It, Fighting it, fighting it out in this match, they were down by a little bit, but not to the point where they looked like they were just like put me out of my misery. They they were they were fighting from from the get. So when they after they got that movie release, we had a, we had our really toe to toe kind of back and forth slugfest on our hands. Oh, absolutely! And getting into round number three, Frank, would, would you mind do you, if you can find those questions from round number three if you if you have the availability to do so? But round number three, I just thought was going to be. Like, you know, uh, it's so funny when you find yourself getting invested in these matches and, and you feel your emotions going the way the match is going. Because as much as I like the Shire Wolves, after we had Team Action on this show, I was like, oh my gosh, Team Action is the greatest thing in the history of the Schmodown. And I wanted them to win so badly. Even like what you alluded to earlier, Can I, I was fantasizing and salivating at the idea of team action versus the Patriots for the championship. I mean, there's all these possibilities I was thinking about. And going into that round number three, I thought Ben Bateman was locked in. I thought Andrew Guy was there for, you know, emotional support and, you know, to pull that one out of his hat if he had to. Uh, How did you think that, I mean, did you think this was going to be to the last question, Christian? Um, I I thought it certainly could go that way. I thought that it just depended on what categories they pick, but I thought that both teams were capable. I mean, you look at what Action just did to with DC, yeah. and they got it down to that five point. And, and Frank will probably say as much, and even said in his stats that Action had never missed a five pointer before. So it's like it could it could go down to the wire, and I I thought it would. I thought it would go. I thought it would probably go down to the fact that the Shire Wolves had to hit their five to win. You know, yeah, Action never missed a five-pointer, and some might say they still haven't. Well, that's definitely not true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a – I'll tell you right now, and I can catch, catch heat for it. I don't give a shit what people say. I was sitting around from the other side of the table. He said – he's, and I've talked to Ben Bateman about this, and you can talk to him about it too, and he, he admits that he, that he got it wrong. So he, he could straight out say it. You can ask him and interview him about it. But, like, he, he said – John Carlos Stanton, which is a yeah. wrong answer. Mm-hmm. He didn't, and then I I couldn't hear what he said, so I should have said, you know, I, I, I just couldn't hear it. So everyone else heard it through the microphone, so I said what, which prompted him then to change his answer to Esposito. Right. So when I said what, he should have said, I just said Stanton, and I would have said, you're wrong. Um, but he changed his answer and because I was because he got prompted and gave himself more time. Now, the, the Sam Levine reference is idiotic and silly at best because it's like Sam Levine said when he was when it was his thing Sam Levine heard the question then said oh wait you're talking about this no 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 then it then it's Johnny Depp 
And then I, I never had a chance to say anything. So then I said, well, that is your final answer. If Ben Bateman would have said Stanton, no, 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 Esposito. Then I would have said, well, what's your final answer? It, it's not. A, it wasn't a matter of saying to him, you know, to Sam Levine, where he went, "Oh, it's Gilbert Grape," and I said, "I was like, said no, it, uh, the answer is Gilbert Grape." And then I went, "What? Oh wait, no, 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 it's Johnny Depp." Then he would have lost. Then it would have been no. Yeah, I thought at the end of the match when Emma Five came out to explain what happened, I thought it was a very good rebuttal to what Andrew and Ben had just said in that interview with Jen. So um, when she said that, I was I could not disagree because you're right. Uh, the prompt being prompted is the main key difference here, and Ben was prompted where Sam wasn't. And I know a lot of people are pointing out that you know uh, I saw a couple comments saying you know because there's a precedent. Um, even if you disagree with that Sam Levine ruling, just because if, if it's if it's wrong, if you think that's incorrect way to rule it, and then it happens again, should you not correct that mistake in the well, as soon as you can, or do you live on with that mistake? And um, I just think you correct it as soon as you can because you don't want to be keep living with a mistake for the rest of the season. No, I'm saying if you dis like people disagreed that Sam Levine got the point that he should not have gotten the point because he corrected himself. Now if if you still believe that and then you tell and then now you're telling me the team actually got robbed of the five points, then it's then you're saying we gotta live with the mistake and I don't think so. The one thing I'll agree with with the fans and I've already had a conversation with I think that it's gonna be a lot of a lot of key players. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna we're gonna have a full on kind of rules breakdown. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna have a lot of the players kind of sit down discuss, have conversations, and then there's just going to be a full-on rule book put in play that, you know, says this is this is the bottom line. It's almost like a player's kind of union, if you will, but not official. Um, right. And it's like, and it's just, this is what we're going to, this is what will happen. You were in the room when we said that this, if this scenario comes up, this is the way it will be played. And everyone will, you know, have to agree on that in general so we can it's in, it, you, you don't even know, people don't even realize it. it's so easy for everyone to say oh well you should have called it this way you in that in 345 people screaming the, the mics not being fantastic and i'm sitting over there and i can't really hear them it it's you know your first instincts is like what what you just say and i don't know what your answer was yeah, I don't so much blame the the what and the prompt thing. And and I understand. I think that y'all made the right ruling uh, in the challenge. I thought that there was a, a valid challenge. Uh, and that's why, obviously, you ruled in the favor of them. When did, though, I guess in this rule summit that you're discussing, is there going to be kind of the, the you know, the Regis Philbin final answer clause attached to all answers? Or is it? That's what we yeah. got to figure out in the room. And I think that that's, that needs to happen, you know, whether it's before or after the collision, we'll see. But, you know, what a lot of people aren't talking about, and I think to Andrew Guy's um, credit, they should be. Andrew Guy knew both of those five pointers. He knew both of them. You know, I don't, and I don't know if, um, I don't know if that will come out or even what I was supposed to say it, but like Guy knew both Esposito and he definitely knew Walter Matthau. It's just one of those tough things that you know you gotta trust your teammates sometimes, and and that that's gonna happen in the game. So, but but last thing, so I wanted to real quick before we get to the end of this match to go back to the the challenge and the final answer thing because it also happened in the celebrity match with Alex Wolf. Alex Wolf, I believe, said you know it was the James Dean question, and I think he said something like, "Oh, uh, streetcar named Desire and and Rebel." Oh, and then no 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 no, and then he corrected himself again. Um, is that that was kind of another example, more of this in the vein of Sam Levine. That that match though was you know that was that was an exhibition to its core. There's a lot of things that happened in that match that wouldn't fly in a real match. Like, I mean he, I mean I like Alex Wolf and he's a great kid, but the the, the spin of the second wheel, like my <laughs> my six year old could have spun stronger than that. So so like so it killed was, me. Yeah, he, and he did it. You know he didn't. What am I going to tell him? No, go back and spin it again. Right, right. It was, it was a co- total. That whole match was goof. So it wasn't really. You really can't take it as much. He knew his stuff, though. I was impressed with him. Like he knew a lot. Yeah. He knew a lot yeah. more than, than most people who kind of come in for their first time. So, especially um, being born in 1997, he made Jesus. me feel old. <laughs> uh, he, he, knew, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. So it was it was it was good to to have him on the show. But yeah, th- th- as far as he can't really take in consideration any rule stuff in that one because we were we kind of threw them to the side on that one on that match. 
So the Shire Wolves come out with the W um, to, I, I guess, really, if if I was an odds maker in Vegas, I would say this was really going to be a pick a match, and it really could have gone either way, and I wouldn't have been shocked. But Shire Wolves continue their dominance. Do you see them going against, I don't know, say it's above the line who pulls out a collision? H- how do you see that match lining up? I'm not I'm not giving anybody a sure victory over world's finest man. I think that yeah. it maybe if nobody knows world's finest it's as I did his think because Clark and you know Rachel have our Clark and Rachel that it's shooing and I again I saw comments of oh they're giving, he's giving them he's giving them world's finest uh, that's going to be that's going to be a cakewalk. World's finest is 2 and 0 and they beat they beat Trek who was a yeah. who was a second away from taking the titles away from the Patriots. Um that was a shocking match, that result, for them beating Trek. Um, I was pretty shocked. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they definitely did. Eric Zipper is a is a underrated player, and I'll give you guys a scoop um, that you will we'll break on this show. Eric Zipper is, is going to be in the tournament in the Inner Geekdom, and, and he's, he's playing against Mike Carlson in the first round. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. That's going to be an interesting match right there. Uh, re- I, I like World's Finest. I like. Go ahead, Frank. I like yeah, yeah, World's re- Finest a lot, though. And regarding the Inner Geekdom uh, tournament, when does that officially start, do you know? It has started already. It's already started. Oh, so the, yeah, these the, past the, matches the, are included in the tournament, is that Oh, that yeah. Correct? So this, okay. this, is not a, this is not a traditional kind of by-the-book bracket tournament. Gotcha. Like Kalinowski making the rules up as he goes. <laughs> Kalinowski, Kalinowski is is using Thad to just push together, and he's his his agenda is to fight for what he believes is the right cause for the players, and he's a spokesman for the players in general and what should be done the right way. So there's no traditional bracket. Like you're, you're going to find out the matchups, you know, sometimes a month, sometimes a week, sometimes a day before they actually happen. And, and let me ask you this real quick on Kalinowski. Uh, what do you think it is that he has on Thad Williams, and do you think it'll help you get your commissionership back? I don't know what it is because he certainly hasn't said anything to me about it. And if it was if it was kind of weighing towards my favor, I think he would have at least told me something. But um, he, he hasn't, and I've known him for a long time. And um, whatever he's got, he's got Thad shaking in his boots. So um, yeah, I know I I know that he's going to plan to use that a lot in the le- next couple of weeks. Well, we'll have to see what that is. Let's get to the post-match. Um, we saw the interviews, of course, uh, from the lovely Jen Sturger. Then when you and Mark Ellis start to kind of do the wrap-up there, uh, Andrew Guy comes back out. And I got to say, he's cutting a hell of a promo. Uh, th- that guy is great. And I was shocked to know that they weren't like avid wrestling guys because they play the role so well. Um, he's cutting a hell of a promo. And he says, you know what? I'm going to bring out Dan Merle. And uh, here comes the fake Dan Merrill out, so and great. he asks him a series of questions, including uh, who played Johnny Cash's wife in Walk the Line. And I think the answer was Jodie Foster, which was just a <laughs> yeah. phenomenal uh, setup there. You know, great on their feet. And then the lights go out, uh, or we hear some music and the lights go out, and four hooded figures appear on the stage, and they reveal themselves as the new four horsemen. We saw... Matt Nost and John Roca, who we could kind of guess were going to be a part of that foursome. Then we saw Mark Yodi Riley and Jason Inman uh, reveal themselves. And let's stop right there for a moment. Um, when you were putting this together and, and maybe Roca came to you or maybe Nost came to you, whoever it was who came up with this new configuration of the four horsemen, uh, just kind of talk me through it. Why Jason Inman? Why Mark Riley? Um, I mean, kind of, uh, kind of an easy answer. Um, why Jason Inman? Who's? I think Jason Inman's starting to make a, a name as the most dominant inner geeks and player we've ever seen. The yeah. guy's won what three straight matches? Four, four, four straight matches. Four straight inner geeks and matches. Um, he he took out the former dominant champion in Hector Navarro with without a sweat. To be completely yeah. honest with you. Um, his only real loss came out of a fatal five turn uh, f- format that we don't really do anymore. He's a dominant player, and you know these factions have to be built upon players who can take titles or win titles in a division that in each one of the divisions. And who better than the actual champion himself? So he 
Inman was kind of a no-brainer, you know. And then as far as as far as Riley goes, Riley is the is the first real star of the Schmodown. And the history between Roca and Riley is is pretty clear. And they've had they've had their history in the past, but they've also part of a, an elite club in the they, for a very long time. They were the they were the one. They were there was only three people trading the championship back and forth back and forth and and it's it's just like wrestling you know or just like boxing it's when when you spend that much time in the ring with somebody and and build that kind of respect with somebody after a while it's like they become like your brother and you understand that you've been through it you understand it and and now that all these kind of young kids are coming up and and there's these new stars being built it, it makes sense that the old legends would, would come back together and and do it do give it a run what does this mean, though, with Jason Inman joining the Four Horsemen, the new version of the Four Horsemen? Uh, what does this mean for Team Trek? I mean, I think that you'll probably find out the answer to that sooner than later. I, I, what, what I would say is that um, I think that Inman and Mance have a really good relationship, and I think Mance is very supportive on stuff that Inman does. I, I think that... Um, I, I also think that maybe it's time for Trek to, uh, to try to find new partners. And see see what they can do in in, in team turn. I mean, maybe Mans can find somebody else in the team league that uh, you know maybe fits his strength even a little bit better than Inman does. I have. I, I just came up with a. It was off the top of my head, and it's probably not going to be true. But <laughs> I thought, well, maybe you know, Sam, uh, Scott Mance is big on Star Trek. So is Sam Witwer, and Sam Witwer's part of the Five Club, and. We always hear Scott Mann shouting "Fight for Life," and uh, I know he loves Emma Fife. So if he went to the Fife Club, that could be that could be interesting. I mean, yeah. it could be. The, but the biggest question is where. Well, that, that's what I'm talking about. Like when you ask for the horseman with Inman, where where does Mance serve? Like what position? Like look at it like baseball or football or what position does he play? Because they have a they have a very strong inner geekdom player in Rachel Cushing. They have a pretty strong. Solid team now in uh, in um, the Shire Wolves, and probably will have another solid team unless it's like Mance and and Draco. But I don't know how those two would would work as a team. I have no idea. And then you have Andraco who's making a run for himself yeah. in the um, yeah. He's got he's he's making a run for himself also, and it's uh, so I don't know about Mance in the Five Club, but you never know. Any anything can occur, but um, it was the Four Horsemen. We've always known about the Four Horsemen, uh, going back to the days of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. But um, when, uh, after they stand on the stage for a little while, uh, after they've de-hooded, if you will, um, I, I see Roca first put up the five. And for a minute, I got really excited because I thought Booker T was joining the Four Horsemen for a second. <laughs> the, the five time. <laughs> which would have been awesome. Yeah. But... Uh, they all put up the five, uh, indicating another member, and then we see someone else take the stage, and after his hood is pulled down, we see that it is the man that we thought was retired, Dangerous Dan Merle, also known as the GOAT, joins the now five horsemen. How did you pull this one off, Christian? This is the coup of the century. Uh, a lot of people are wondering, where is this Andrew Guy stuff going? You know, Frank and I had a lot of off-the-record talks trying to plan, plot, and figure it out. Um, wh- wh- could talk to me about it. How, how did this come about? Was this always the plan when Andrew Guy came back at the free-for-all? Lay it all on me. You, know, like, you want behind-the-scenes stuff? Do it. All right, so... The, the real answer to that is that Dan Merle was supposed to legit return at the free-for-all. That's when he was coming back. He was supposed to come back at the free-for-all. And circumstances, certain things happened. He wasn't able to make it. So um, and it was very last minute that he couldn't make it. So that's one of those things to where you got to think on your feet. So guy shows up and, he's, and, and he picks his spot. And I was like, I have an idea. Why don't we play Merle's music and then we can just pretend that you stole Merle's spot? And he's like, let's do it. A guy guy can take anything and kind of run with it. He's, he's, he's that good, you know? So it's like, so he did it. He took it. He ran with it. And then I, I was just like, we just need to really keep building off of this thing and, and keep, you know, shooting scenes. I said, well, I got to check in with, with 
Dan first. And so the big thing with Dan is Dan wanted to, Dan told me after he and I played that he was going to come back eventually. It was just a matter of when, because Dan is a guy that wants to play and he always wanted to play. It wasn't a matter that he wasn't into it anymore or that he wasn't into storylines or any of that stuff. It was, it's actually the opposite. The, the thing is Dan's the type of guy, he doesn't want to be in it unless he can commit to it unless he can actually be involved because he, it, it kind of, it always rubbed him the wrong way when we did the lion's den thing and he, and he, and he couldn't, he couldn't commit to it. He couldn't be there enough because of his other obligations at screen junkies. So I was working, it took me a bit and you know, telling him, you know, having conversations with him and saying, look, this is, I think the plan that can work and Saturdays are easy for you. And we, we taped the collision on Saturday. We taped the live events on Saturday and, and I said, why don't you come back and we, we'll do this horseman angle here and I can make it work for the schedule and the um, rest is history. Well, it's kind of like, you know, with, with Marl showing up, it, it really shakes up the, the schmodown again. Um, but it sounds like you really wanted him back. You think that Dan Merle adds a lot to the schmodown. Am I right? Well, yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> – I mean, and let's not let's not also – Forget and bury the lead that uh, Riley's back too. You got, you've got. Yeah, you got Riley was supposed two, to be retired the, as well. You got the two-time champion Mark Riley, the first two-time champion Mark Riley, with the second two-time champion Dan Merle back. But yeah, I mean, former Merle's champion of John Roca, and the former singles former champion, the former team champions in top ten, and you know the inter, current inner geekdom champion. So this, the 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 faction is speaks for itself, but. As far as Merle goes, he's got this thing right now that I think, you know, Tyson had when Tyson was, was fighting. He's got that air of uh, kind of invincibility about him. Even though he's lost twice, he still has that he still has that thing about him that it's that intimidation thing of how much the guy knows and, and what he's done in, in his accomplishments and how he's the first to do things and, and what he was doing in the league, of course. I mean, and the way that the fans, he's revered by the fans and he's – and and you know, when you say Dan Merle's going to play, because think about it, I'll, I'll say five matches to you guys about how excited you get. I say Snyder, Snyder versus uh, Merle. You know, I say Bibiani versus Merle, McWeeny versus Merle, Irwin versus Merle, Cushing versus Merle. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And then oh Wolf, man. Wolf versus Merle, Irwin versus Merle, and then, and then, and then the big one is Levine versus Merle, too. I mean, like there's like look at all those matches now that are there that are all all matches that everyone wants to see. I mean the the Tyson Holyfield match is, is Levine versus Merle. Yeah. So Bibiani and Snyder are gonna play before the collision, and then Sam will defend the title against one of them. Um, so you know who even knows how long Sam will be champion if those two will ever be able to play and. And who, who knows how long before Merle's got to get a championship shot or if he even wants one. Maybe he wants to focus on teams. Maybe he wants to focus on singles. I mean, he hasn't really made his intention. He hasn't really said what he wanted to do. He just knows he wants to come in and, and shut Guy up. That's it. Well, he does have a former team member in Mark Riley now in the Horsemen, so I suppose that could be a possibility down the line. Um, I'd say it's probably a... a I think that's a pretty easy bet to make at Vegas that those two are going to team back up. You know, the return of Dan Merle, uh, and you'll understand this one, Christian, is kind of like the you know when Shawn Michaels came back in 2002. You know, you didn't really know why he was coming back. He had that program with Triple H, you know, kind of like he's going to have with Andrew Guy. And then all the possibilities are open. You know, does he want to just go out there and, and just have fun? Does he want to win the title? I mean, there are a lot of options out here. And uh, just like Shawn Michaels was the greatest in-ring competitor, I think we can all safely say Dan Merle is. Um, did you get the reaction that you wanted? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so one of the it's one of the things that when I was pitching it to the guys, I said, this is what's going to happen. I said, you know, you guys are going to come out. It's going to be quiet. You're going to put the four up. They're going to see the cloaked figures. They're going to go nuts. Then they'll get a big pop when Nost reveals his hood. They've got a big pop when Roku does it. Then it's going to really start to get louder when, when Inman reveals it. And then they'll go nuts when Riley's there. And then we'll, we'll, we'll lower the lights. We'll have the shining music come out. And then once Merle reveals himself, the, you know, just brace yourself into your seat because the whole roof is going to blow off. And it did. 
So it was just a matter of knowing it, it's really trusting in the investment of of the fan reading the room and meeting everybody when they're there. And people were they were invested Schmodown fans. These are 330, 340 people. I'm sure they all listen to the rundown. I'm sure they all know what's going on, who the champions are. It's not like just a kind of casual fans stumbling into the place. These are people wearing Shire Wolf shirts and action shirts and dressed. People were cosplaying as team action. It was it was like a it's just you know, it was like a mini Comic Con for the yeah. showdown with matches. So and fr- that, that, yeah. And Frank, how did it how did it feel in the live room? Is it like Christian Man, described? Let me, let me tell you. Like you can kind of envision what's what's gonna take place, but when you hear that music in that theater and the crowd is literally just roaring for like a good solid minute straight, um it, it Damn, it was so cool, man. It was so cool to be in that room when that happened. Um, it's for sure, you know, top three moments in Schmodown history, that reveal. Um, you might even say it's number one, but, um, you know, certainly there could be other ones, but I won't disagree with living in the moment. It's like number one moment right now. So being there, hearing that crowd, um, seeing everyone's reaction, um, it was, as a Schmodown fan, it's, I don't think it gets any better than that. How great was that? How great was that? That music for the horsemen came out. Oh, it was it was awesome. I, I mean, that that really set the tone. That you know, it, it it was just pure theatrics at that point, and the reveal was great. Um, you know, everyone dehooding one at a time, and then you bring down the lights again, and then here comes Merle. Um, it, it's, I mean, like I said, it's as a Schmodown fan, it's what you live for, and uh, it's one of the best things. Uh, the Schmodown has ever done. How do you keep? How do you keep? How do you keep coming up with ideas, though, Christian? I mean, <laughs> is it you just kind of let the characters dictate the stories, or is it you know do you throw on the WWE Network and, and take trips down memory lane? You know, how do you keep coming up with these different storylines? I think it's a mixture of all of that. I think it's a matter. Of, I mean, I was joking around with Nose yesterday because I have there's there's another idea coming down the pike in the next couple of weeks that. I know you guys are gonna lose your minds over. Um, ah. It's gonna be it's gonna be a, an open discussion on your show once it's released. Um, <laughs> and and I was telling Nost about it, and he's like, "Do you, do you just like is that all you think about?" The like, case, like he's like, "You just kind of driving around, and you know, you, you you try to you're supposed to be thinking about something, and you're just thinking about this." And I go, "Pretty much, it's pretty yeah. much what happens." <laughs> but it's you know, I'm always thinking of and. You know what's the next angle? How this can work? How it can play out? Like I have, I have six different options of what I think the main event's going to be on September eighth. Oh man, any uh, any teasers there? Any any hints that you might want to drop? All I can say is it's not really a teaser. I already let it loose. Already is that you know Dan Merle's in the event, so that's take that for what it is. Merle's going to be competing one way or another on September eighth. Now, who or with who or. You know, we we don't know yet. And speaking of live events, just thinking about into the future, what what would be the one main event that out of collision, free for all, spectacular, all that? What would be the one if you could do it? Um, what would be the one event that you would like to do live? Right now, my like my 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 dream main event that I could give to fans if I could do it tomorrow and it all made sense. That or just any of the other events that you currently have, like collision or spectacular, free for all. I think I think spectacular would be fun. It's just the problem is that it, spectacular takes like uh, it takes like five to seven hours to shoot it, and I don't know yeah. if you can really ask an audience. You know, it's it's different with like WrestleMania. You know, you, WrestleMania, it's like you you've got this kind of big venue. You can do a whole bunch of different things, and and there's all these events you can do. And I don't know if I can ask an audience to sit around for five to seven hours to to watch all these matches, but. Um, Maybe the free for all. I think the free for all with thirty five competitors can be done um, live, and I think it can be done with um, with the right timing and everything too. So I think the free for all would be pretty exciting to do live. It'd be a, it would be an adventure, and the production team would probably kill me for even <laughs> mentioning it. But but I think it's possible. Uh, a couple more things for you, Christian. Before we let you go, um, a couple of competitors have made some statements about some of the questions that are asked during the Schmodown. I'm sure you know what I'm referring to. Any response to that? Um, you mean as far is this is this past stuff with like you, with stuff that Drew and Sam brought up in your show? Yeah. Um, I think that 
there's some merit to what Sam is talking about where, and I've had a conversation with Skaliski in general about there's some, t- this is the thing though, that people don't realize, com- especially competitors, is that Chris Skaliski has a couple of writers working for him. The guy is one dude really working with, you know, Aaron and, and a few other people, but just firing out question after question, after question, after match, after match. He's, and we don't give him enough credit of all the stuff he gets right, you know? And like, there's a thing where when it comes to, like I told him, my note was, it's hard to ask a question about a movie someone saw once and then say, well, what town is that? Or what movie is that person? Like I saw, there was a question today that I saw as an example of uh, in the Julia Roberts category. And it's what movie was Julia Roberts promoting during American Sweethearts? And unless you are obsessed with that movie, Jesus. unless you're obsessed with that movie, there's no fucking way you know that answer. There's no way. Yeah, a little, a little yeah. difficult. There's no, there's <laughs> it's no pretty way. crazy. There's no way. So it's like things like that. But again, that's that's just from all the questions you're writing. There's things that are going to happen. It's just a matter of scaling that back a little bit. And I've been I've been going into the document and, and changing some stuff up and doing some things too to make sure that a little because I, I think it, you know a more a question instead is the, the whatever the name of the movie is in a Julia Roberts thing was a movie Julia Roberts was promoting in what film. Like, that's a little bit, it's a harder five-pointer, but it's still something, oh, what the hell was that thing she was in? I didn't see it, but I remember the trailer. It was, oh, American Sweethearts. That's what it was. Like, there's, you can you can get it. It's still hard, but you can get it. So it's just a matter of retooling it. So I don't disagree with that. Um, I just think sometimes it's easier for competitors to just, you know, you know so, so they, they approach it as if it's like this thing that them, it's the writers against the, the competitors and the competitors, I get that the competitors are the ones that are in front of the camera and the ones that take the brunt of the comments and stuff too. But it's like, you got to cut Skaliski some, some slack. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think that, you know, Chris works his ass off and, and I, and hats off to him. And, and I, and I like what you said there, you know, people don't really pay attention to how much that guy gets right. Uh, it's easy to focus on the things that he, you know, could do a little bit better on. But that man is a machine. He is a real machine. Oh, you don't even know. I mean, you guys know from what you see. But you, you know, yeah, he's in, the, he's in the grind with me all, all the time. He's sending stuff and and always working stuff. And like I, it's like you, the fact that there are like the fact that he's still around. <laughs> it, it, you know what I mean? It's like it's yeah. like this is one guy that's running this whole thing. And like I, I get like anything else you get you'll get frustrated and something will happen and it's like a matter of well i wish that was there but then i think to myself this guy is killing himself over here all these different things that he does every day and he's crushing it so what am i gonna do i'm like again with this american sweetheart thing i'm not gonna i mean he'll hear this on the show but it's like it's not a matter of i'm not gonna i'm just gonna change the question you know i'll just change it up and 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 that's fine and i and i have the conversation with him and he goes okay i'll, I'll work on it and he changes yeah. it up yeah no, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, you know, that's been the coolest thing about the Schmodown is just to see the changes over time. And and, it, and it's a growing, living game. It is. And the thing that gets me, and I had this conversation with a competitor recently, is that the one thing that I will not budge on, because the, the, that particular thing I understand that I, and I happen to agree with, we just need to, we got to realize that there are certain movies that you can't ask someone, oh, what's the town of this movie that maybe someone saw once I thought it's like they, they, no one's going to remember that kind of shit. And I think that that, that needs to be changed. Just, I, I agree with Sam when it comes to that. What I don't agree with is the constant conversation that a lot of people have. And I get this a lot from different competitors and I got it from Andrew guy this past week is the, the notion of, well, that, that should be a two pointer and that should be a three pointer. Oh, that was too easy to be a two. It's that's such a subjective thing. Now this is a different yeah. thing. A two pointer is definitely who directed Jurassic Park. I mean, that's like yeah. a well-known thing that mo- if you watch movies, you know that. Now, when you start to get into certain level of elite competitors, right? Who directed Young Adult? Like you guys, I don't know. Maybe you knew that right <laughs> off the bat when you watched it. Um, may- maybe you didn't. Um, I would guess that you may, and this is not to insult you guys, but I would guess that you didn't know who directed Young Adult. You would be correct. No. <laughs> okay, right, and that's but but to but to Sam Levine and Drew McQueenie, that was the easiest question in the world, and 
to but to be fair to to Snyder, it was pretty easy. But that's why he was the champion because he knows that shit. Um, same thing. Like there's a well, that would spoil a, a match coming up. But there was a particular question that was coming up for a match that came up in a match. One competitor said, "Ah, do you think that that was a that was a five pointer? Like that was pretty easy." And I'm like, "That's because you know that stuff." And I and like I'm like, "There's no one else here that knows that, and no one knew it." It's like because. The, and it's elite players that feel that way because to them they know a lot of shit, and it's also the old, the players who are a little older in age will will get it. So it's not this consistency of two pointers, three pointers, five pointers. It's there are elite players out there, and even some of the fans who might not know stuff. The, a, the average casual fan who, in order for this thing to really survive and grow, is that we've got to start taking people who don't watch movies like we do that can tune in and go. Oh, I didn't, sure. I didn't know that one. And it's super easy because otherwise you want to get those entertaining characters and personalities to play. And I think, Brad, you just said it before. You don't, you don't know any of these questions from Star Wars trivia, but you're riveted and you're sitting there and you're watching. Yeah. And you're pretty much that casual fan that I'm looking for in regards to, you know, in Star Wars there. But as far as the average fan, they need to just be able to answer questions. And the elite players should be able to hit them and think that they're easy. Um, you kind of talked about this a little bit regarding your example with America's Sweetheart. Uh, do you think the wording of the question um, helps dictate the difficulty of that that question, like in the two or three or a five pointer? That the wording should be kind of in a certain way if it's a two pointer, if it's a three pointer, or if it's a five pointer. Too, it's again, it's too, it's it's too hard. If, if you know, and I I make this point so many times that if. We had like say let's say we had ten thousand patrons, right? Let's say we had about ten thousand patrons. I could have a, a writing staff of like, you know, ten to fifteen writers, and I could and then we have a full. I can just have one guy who's just like proofread all these things, make sure that these are written this particular way. We have one writer with a with a with a limited staff, and and he's got a, he's got an, um, a writer's assistant that he has, or or, or another writer that he's got. Um, we, we don't have a full elite team yet. This is why I try to tell people like how important it is when it comes to the Patreon stuff. Like it's like this is where we're we're functioning now and we're functioning well and we're able to, to run the show the way we've been running it. But there's not going to be any leaps and bounds with Android stuff and all that kind of stuff because we're you know we're at like sixteen or seventeen hundred patrons and and we're we're pushing we're pushing to do more stuff. You know, I think part of the problem, and it's, I guess a good problem, is the way you guys run and produce the show, people tend to think that you have a much larger budget than you really do. And I think that's kind of a blessing and a curse because you guys do so well with what you have. And so in turn, the fans um, expect a higher quality product and then which you sometimes um, doesn't live up to their expectations. Well, the good news is I just found a cookie in my back seat, so that's oh. good. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of cookie? A chocolate chip cookie. I think oh, that's pretty solid. That's, that's um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the production of it is is definitely. Um, <laughs> oops, sorry. This cookie's delicious. Um, so you're good. This, um, yeah, no, it's 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 the budget is definitely. It is what it is, and we make it look sweet. And I and I. And I have to give that's that's all credit to, to Thad and Dennis and, and the production team and Copster and Joey and you know Cody Adam the, those guys those guys Brian are, Ward does great on those graphics yeah, and yeah, really yeah, right, really right, pretties right, up the place yes yeah. Brian Ward makes it makes it seem like you know it's a it's just kind of big high level thing we're we're gorilla still we're still mm -hmm. gorilla and we have a very limited small um, budget we don't I mean we got a nicer I mean nicer budget than last season. I mean, like I said, the competitors are able to get paid now, and the writing staff. Um, the, we have two editors now instead of one, and we're able to do a little bit more. We, we, you know, these everybody gets the you know there's food that I get for the competitors when they come in. And we're able to do a little bit more for the live shows. The props are a little better. I can you know, and now now if it's like I need a wheel slice, I can I can just I have a you know Alex PA, and we pay Brianne to run the Patreon, so that stuff adds up. And then you know, next thing next thing you know. That's it. You tapped out. Like, but you're but you're a sellout now, Christian. <laughs> of course, because you're getting paid for. <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's but but the funny thing is though, is that Mark and I don't see a damn dime off it. We're paying everybody else, and that's fine. That's what that's how you have to that's how you have to do it though. You've got to be able to like invest or believe in your investment enough 
to yeah. where you say, okay, I'm going to, the money that we're making here, we're going to spend it all this year in order to grow it. And, and I don't know what else we need to do as far as um, Patreon goes, like what else we need to um, offer or, or get more people involved. And I, I think that one of the things that I want to try to do, and I, I floated that out there before, and I just don't know, it's, it's just a matter of the technology itself. I think that what I want to try to start doing is is offer inside of that tier of the Patreon um, to be able to stream the live matches. Yeah, that'd be very nice. And you know, it's like for the, you'd still get them on on YouTube. You you know, week two right. weeks later, but you could watch them. You can watch them that night live. You know, and I just I think that that's possible. I just um I just have to look into it. Well, Christian, it sounds like you've reached your destination. Uh, last question for you. It's actually non schmodown related. Uh, you caused a little bit of controversy, <laughs> or you were the facilitator of controversy caused in my uh, other endeavor, Heated Conversations. I just have to ask you real quick, Freddie Prince Jr., a Booker T., and a barbecue cook-off, who are you putting your money on? Oh, man, you're going to get me in trouble with both my friends here. Um, <laughs> I don't know. You know, here, here's the here's the thing. I I trust in the fact that I bet you Booker T can cook up a storm, but I've never I've never read Booker T's cookbook. Oh, oh okay. There you go. Yeah, it's shots. Probably the cookbook. Freddie, Freddie <laughs> Prince, Freddie, you know, and Freddie Prince Jr. I mean, that dude cooks up a storm, but I don't know, man. I'm not going to mess with the five time champ, but um, but I I tell you what, I would I would be there with my fat belly eating all of it. Oh yeah, you and I both. Well, Christian, thanks so much for joining us. That is the creator. Christian Harloff on all the happenings in the Schmodown, a successful live event that took place and that you got to see. By the way, incredible turnaround time. Uh, just miraculous staff. I know you guys were working overtime to turn that thing around uh, in just a few short days. So shout out to everyone who made that live event possible. Aaron Wilhelm needs the, needs the credit there. He um, We asked him because I, I, I just, I didn't want, I was worried about the spoilers and everything too. And and I asked him if he could get it done in time, and and he's so good. He's like, yeah, I can make it work, and he did. Yeah, he's he's an, he's an incredible talent. You have quite the staff over there, Christian. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Schmodown Rundown. Uh, you know, I'm hopefully you get to pop back in here from time to time. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Thank you. Love what you're doing over there, and um, look forward to uh, hearing more. All right, that is awesome. Christian Harloff, the creator of the movie trivia Schmodown. Uh, more of the Schmodown Rundown back in a second. Well, that was the man in charge, Christian and Harloff, here on the Schmodown Rundown. An insightful hour-plus interview with the creator. I thought he addressed a lot of the controversies that went down and answered a lot of questions. Got a little bit more behind the scenes uh, than I thought we would, which I enjoyed hearing about the creation of the Five Horsemen, bringing back Dan Merle. Of course, you were at the live event, Frank. Just awesome stuff. I, I really enjoyed Christian, and shout-out to him for making the time. Yeah, it was great to hear from Christian and, and his thoughts on the live match and and a little bit of the controversies and uh, what he thinks about you know um, other competitors' thoughts in regards to questions and rules. And so we got a lot of good stuff come out of here, um, and that I think should quiet down some of the uh, the fans that have concerns. And I mean, quite frankly, there are legitimate concerns too um, that they're not just thrown out there wildly. I mean, some people do that, yeah, but yeah, of um, course. Uh, I think hopefully, just I think. Hopefully the fans realize that they're, they're never resting on their laurels. They're always trying to figure out a way to improve it. And when you have players invested like Sam Levine, Drew McWeeny, and Team Action, those guys, and Clark Wolf and all of them, you know, um, they're going to strive to make the game uh, as 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 well as they can. And I know Chris uh, Skaliski is going to try and do as good a job as he can. So uh, hearing it from Christian, though, I think hopefully is reassuring to a lot of fans out there that um, they're, they're not – resting on anything and they're gonna just gonna try and keep improving and do what they got to do i i agree i i think that you know cons but like i said you know, the game's evolving you know i mm -hmm. mean every sport changes the rules you know what i mean like they they institute new rules uh they they fix them they manage them i mean i know the nba is trying to do it with hack a shack there are all <laughs> yeah. kinds of things that, that that happen in in all sports and all games and it's always ever growing so you know, you don't always rail against it. You can make your voice be heard, but, you know, don't slam and be like, oh, my goodness, you know, what right. is going and, on here? And one of the things that Christian, you know, I talked about, which I think is probably one of the more important parts here, is that they're really working on, like, a rule book here with input from all the players. And, you know, had 
you know, it's not really up to Christian to, to, to present that to the entire community. It's not up, it's not really um, incumbent upon him to to present to the community every single little thing that they're doing to improve the game. Meanwhile, you still have people commenting this, that, and the other about, you know, this is this is what's wrong, this is what we need to change. And and you can you can say all that stuff, but at the same time, I hope those really vitriolic fans out there realize that they are working on stuff like this, uh, like a rule book and um, anything like that. So uh, I think we can just kind of relax and you know enjoy it what it is. But also, I'm not saying not to criticize or have opinions or give you know whatever you want to say about the showdown. I just think it's important to remember that. Yes, it's like this today, but that doesn't mean it's going to be like this for the foreseeable future and whatnot. Yeah, 100% agree. So with that being said, shout out to Christian Harloff for joining us. Make sure you all uh, tweet us. Tell us what you think of the Christian Harloff interview at ShmodanRD. But before we get out of here, speaking of tweets, we got to go with a uh, a segment that used to be a favorite of the Jay Leno Tonight Show every Monday. <laughs> That That's is right. headlines. It was, on it was on Mondays, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. I know my history. That is headlines. And Frank Janish, why don't you take it away with some of the headlines on Twitter from the week that was the movie trivia Schmodown? Yeah, so I specifically put out a tweet on at Schmodown RD about the team Action Shirewolves. Basically, give me a headline for the events that took place at the second uh, the second part of the live event. And we're gonna start off here with Michael Campbell. He says five stars for the five horsemen. And then we got uh, Slinky Redfoot saying, unexpectedly dangerous. And then we got another one. Uh, let's see here. Peter Butler, he says, holy bleep. Because this is it's a family-friendly show. Holy bleep, the goat returns for vengeance. Hashtag five horsemen. Uh, let's see. We got another one here. Oh, this is a fun one here. Uh, BB Eva at Dutch Movie Buff says, five men wearing matching outfits make crowd go insane. And yes, they did. Uh, there's another one. I like um, that one. That's my winner right there. Well, I got I got a couple more for you. Um, Army of Twelve Monkeys at Joel's Joel's now Joel Snow. Uh, I'm gonna switch it up just a little bit so it makes sense for a headline. He goes, um, "We don't need to watch Ocean's Ocean's Eight. We just witnessed a monumental heist." And I think that's true by getting Dan Merle in ah, the Five Horsemen. That's a pretty good one. Yes. Uh, oh, here's another one from BB Eva at Dutch Movie Buff. I like this one too. Uh, cleanest audience ever after everyone gets soap thrown at them. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> um, and then here's one that I think is one that Christian may not care about, uh, but I do find funny. Uh, Kyle Harlow from the Facebook post I put in there in the master post uh, in the group. He goes, Harlow throws team action to the wolves. And that's Ooh. your headlines. Ooh. Well, that is your headlines here this week on the Schmodown Rundown. Frank, last question before we get the hell out of here. Who wins a championship first, Dan Merle or LeBron James? Oh, man. That's fucking Dan Merle. All, yeah. <laughs> easy. Okay. That's an easy one. That's an easy one. That, that's an easy one. Well, we'll be back next week. Um, I know Frank and I will both be on the road, and uh, Chris Clark will all be traveling next week, but we're going to make sure we get a show in to you one way or another. Also, we have to give a huge shout-out to this month's Patreon giveaway recipient of the month for June. Mr. Jason Humphreys has received a 6x6 photo of the champ himself, Sam Levine. Congratulations, Jason. You are one of a kind. Uh, Frank, why don't you let the people know where they can find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at FrankieJ29. Also, check out SD Rundown Stats on Twitter for more stats. I just dropped a whole bunch of uh, round one, round two stats for singles league and team league. Go ahead and check those out. See where your uh, favorite players rank in terms of accuracy and how well they do overall through two rounds of play and all that stuff. A lot of good stuff there on SD Rundown Stats. I like those uh, stats a lot. Christopher, Provolone, Piscotti. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you Salami can find me. Jones, go ahead. 
<laughs> you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chris Cluck 8788. Those numbers mean nothing. You can find me on YouTube at Take Three Productions, where this weekend we are doing a marathon uh, to d in, d in dedication for uh, dog charities for a good dear friend of all of ours of the show, Patrick Campbell. He lost a, a family member, Kirk. And yeah, um, it's for him and it's dedicated to Kirk and long live Kirk and we miss you, buddy. Yeah, uh, definitely. Shout out to uh, Pat. We love you, Pat. And, uh, you know, sorry for your loss. This episode is obviously dedicated to the great Kirk, the captain of all of us, uh, the great Captain Kirk. So uh, shout out to you, man. And uh, Janice, you know, I've been thinking. Oh, you've been thinking? No, that's new for you. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> You know, there's been a lot of talk about the rundown schmodown. It really think, hasn't, actually. But there's okay. been tons of talk. Yeah, That's all talk. people talk about. That's yeah, a little bit, yeah. And uh, I think we should uh, we should do a maybe a, maybe we can do some sort of charity situation uh, mm. for our next rundown schmodown. And I think next week you've have an you've you've teased an idea you have for a uh, a stipulation match. And I think that next week on the schmodown rundown you should let the world know. What that stipulation is, I've been dying to find out. Oh. Okay. So next week, Schmodown Rundown, we're going to talk about Rundown Schmodown 2, the one-on-one -on -one stipulation match between Brad Gilmore and Frank Janish. Oh, it's going to be good. It's going to be damn good. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>